Hello again and welcome to the Common Sense Gospel. I'm Danny Simmons. And I'm Kurt Norbert. And we are looking at another question from Jesus. We've looked at several as we've gone through these past few weeks and we'll look at another one today. Luke 6 and verse 46. The question Jesus asks is, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? So it's a very simple statement, but he is challenging those who are listening to him. Uh, he's challenging us and saying, why would you cry out? Why would you call me Lord in public, in private, uh, before me? Why would you say Lord and then not do what I say? Because the word Lord demands a lordship that you do what you're told if he truly is Lord. So the question is very simple, and yet, as it always is, it's unbelievably deep. Uh, what What is the problem with this, at least the, the reason why it's being asked? What, what's the heart of the problem? Well, I think this is probably one of man's basic weaknesses, is that in any realm where God tells us to do something or he shows us what he wants done he describes for us what he expects out of us in service and in our lives <clears throat> and as you said the idea of lord here implies one who has authority if there's a lord then there's a servant somewhere for him to be lord over if, and if he is the lord that makes me the servant mm -hmm. the problem with man and a, a heart that has been corrupted with sin is that we just have to add a little bit of our own self into it. We have to do it a little bit our way. Uh, you know, it might have worked then, but now got to make a few improvements in God's plan because times have changed. Yeah. And so it, it's always wanting to make what we think is improve God's way. Well, if it's God's way, it doesn't need improvement. It's already the best it is. Um, so right from the start here, Jesus is addressing this issue. It's always been a problem and it always will be a problem. It's easy for us to deceive ourselves into thinking that Jesus is my Lord, but I can still kind of do the things I want to do. Yeah, it's interesting because you say, you know, from the beginning of time, it's always been this way. Man's always had this condition. And we just want everyone who's listening today to know, Kurt and I searched the scriptures. I mean, from Genesis, and we spent a lot of time looking through the Bible, and we can't find one example of a human being calling the Lord, Lord, and then not doing what he says. I just couldn't find yeah, one. And that being acceptable to God. Yeah. I, I found a lot of examples of people acknowledging that he's God, but then not living it right and that's the hypocrisy jesus is looking at here you you can't call jesus lord if you are not going to obey him in everything that he says yep because you make one change and now you're the boss so who's the first case in point of a man who looks to god as god clearly sees him as god and yet doesn't really want to do everything he's told him to do well the one that uh, comes to mind right off the bat for me is cain Yep. The example in chapter 4 where uh, Abel brought uh, the firstling of his flock, but Abel brought the fruit of the field. Um, apparently, he was a farmer. And it we're told in Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 through 5, that the Lord had respect for Abel's offering, but he did not respect Cain's offering, and Cain's countenance fell. And... The Lord addresses the issue and basically tells him, you've got a sin problem here. You need to master that. But here's an, a situation. Why was it sinful for Cain to bring an offering to God? That's obviously what God wanted because Abel brought an offering and it was accepted. Why isn't mine? Well, it, it's not because of a heart attitude necessarily. I mean, that that underlies it. Mm -hmm. But God doesn't say, you know, I just didn't like your attitude. The only difference that is spelled out here is that Abel brought a firstling of the flock and Cain brought some fruit of the field, something he'd harvested. Mm -hmm. That's the only difference. God accepts Abel's, but not Cain's. So, so you have two brothers. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's four people on the earth. 
yeah. potentially from, from what we understand. Yeah. Cain and Abel are going to sacrifice to the Lord. And, and as you pointed out, they're going to bring their very best. And I, you know, there's part of me that can sympathize with Cain because um, I've, I've tended to a garden for many years and um, I think about the first fruits and the time, the effort, the energy that comes before any of that happens. I mean, you've got to be out there every day. You've got to monitor the plants, water. Um, they, they just require all kinds of things to stay strong and healthy and, and, and even just watching that to make sure they're healthy and they're not being hit with some kind of mildew or mold or anything that would destroy the plant, this first fruit comes and, and you think, okay, you know, it's working. It, this mm-hmm. is it. And, and I, I know the Lord's involved. I'm so thankful for that. He's part of that process. Without him, it's never going to do anything just because it's going to be dirt without God. So he's involved. And, and I'm hoping you can see with me that I'm and mentally I'm thinking, I've done this with the help and the assistance of the Lord. Sure. This is the and this is the best I have. I've set these aside for Him, and now coming to the Lord to offer the best that He and I built together. As far as it works with growing a fruit of the field, um, I'm fully convinced that He will be well pleased that I gave Him the best that I have. And then he says, I've, I've, he shows no respect for it. He has no regard. He, he doesn't want what you've brought. And, and it says that his countenance fell because his heart's crushed. He, he's thinking, what in the world? You know, Abel's always, Abel's always first. Abel always gets what's best, however humans respond. And, and as you said, God speaks to him. But there's a bigger picture that's, that's shown here for us. Number one is we know for sure that they both knew what was required by God as far as sacrifice goes. Yep. They were both bringing an offering, so they knew they that, knew was, sacrifice was that required, was the deal. Yeah. And they knew what it was that God required in that sacrifice. Adam and Eve are fully aware of that. Uh, animals were sacrificed so that God could clothe them when they committed the first sin. So we, we have that picture there. Cain and Abel are now offering. Um, and, and so think about what God required. It is the animal sacrifice. Why? Because the blood of an innocent substitute must stand in the place of the sinner. So when Cain says, well, I'll bring the best of my fruit, and he's got this whole world kind of flowing around in his mind about, God's going to love this. This is great. I'm giving the very best that I have, and I want him to have it, and his heart's in the right place. The problem is, as you and I know, backing up, we can see that he didn't bring the sacrificial atonement that Clearly, God had laid out because Abel's was accepted. And so his heart's excited about what he's doing. Uh, he's put thought into it. He's put time into it. Everything is, is in the right place except that which he brought. And he, the bigger picture that he missed is that there's no blood in this offering. Mm-hmm. And, and we know, obviously, all the way to the point of Jesus, that blood is required for sin to be forgiven or for atonement to take place. Um, so in, in, in that simple example that we're talking about, we can see the huge problem that Cain has stepped into. Uh, even though he's wrestling with it, he doesn't fully understand why God didn't accept his offering. It seems he doesn't understand. We can tell from where we're sitting that he missed everything yep. by bringing something that God didn't ask for. Yeah, and to even to address the issue even more, uh, as you said, he may have convinced himself that I'm, this is, I'm offering the best. I've worked hard on this, and the Lord blessed me with increase, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give what I have to him. Well, what's he got to go on that I'm convinced? What, what has convinced him that the <laughs> Lord will be pleased? That's a good question. Because God didn't say to do that. The, the real key is in Hebrews 11. By faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain's, mm. by which he was accounted righteous. So he offered his sacrifice by faith. What does that mean? Well, he, he trusted in God. He did what God told him to do. Maybe he didn't understand why I have to bring this animal, but that's what God said to do. Cain did not do what God said to do. Therefore, he was not offering by faith. No. And God will not accept a faithless sacrifice. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing they, by the word of God. That is right. So now we know that they were told. They, they were told. That's they the only knew way faith better. comes. Yep. So That's awesome. It was Cain's 
offering. Mm. This is what I'm going to give to God. And he'll like and it. And he'll like it. Yep. Or else. You know, <laughs> now I'm putting words in his mouth. But that's, you know, let's strip away all the fancy stuff like, oh, he just wanted to glorify God and all the schmoozy, good feeling stuff that we use to justify our disobedience. Mm. He disobeyed God. That's right. That's why I, the, the text there doesn't tell us anything about his attitude or his thinking or here's what convinced me to bring this different sacrifice than Abel brought and expect God to receive it because that's all irrelevant. That's right. You either do it or you don't. And that's the bottom line. And so Jesus is nailing that. Why do you call me Lord and don't do what I say? I'm not your Lord if you don't do what I say. Nope. And so don't be a hypocrite. If you don't want to do what I say, don't recognize me as Lord. Don't call me Lord. Because it's already true. Because it's empty. It's already true in your yeah. life. But if you are going to call me Lord, then demonstrate it. Right. Show in your life that I'm your Lord. And there are so many other examples. We're all familiar with Nadab and Abihu who brought profane fire before the Lord, which the text says he had not commanded them. Right. Well, he had, he had commanded them what to bring. But they brought fire he had not commanded. So I think a lot of times people will do what they do because their reasoning is, well, the Lord didn't say we couldn't. Mm. And so that means we can. What they're failing to see is when the Lord says what to do, that's what you do. <laughs> right. If you add to it or you detract from it or you change it in any way, it is no longer what the Lord said to do. Yep. It's something he has not commanded. And that's, that was the fault of Nadab and Abihu. They brought profane fire before the Lord, which he hadn't commanded them, and he demonstrated how he felt about that. He put some fire back on them. I tried. From before the altar and they consumed died. them right there. Yeah. Uh, Saul with Agag, which is Samuel almost turns into a humorous episode, although it's not. He, he uses the sarcasm to make his point because it was a serious situation. God had told the people, uh, I'm going to take vengeance on the Amalekites because of what they did to you when you came out of the wilderness. So you go and completely destroy them. Leave nothing. Not only the men, but you kill the women, the children, and all of the cattle. Well, Saul comes back, and he's killed the cattle, most of it. Mm -hmm. um, we're not told anything about the women and the children, but he spared Agag, too. Only reason I can think of is as a trophy. Look, here's a king I conquered. Right. But he has the gall, and... I don't know if it's just desperate self-justification or an example of how easily we can deceive ourselves. But he comes to Samuel after the, the carrying out the mission and says, I have done what the Lord commanded me to do. Well, what had the Lord commanded him to do? Kill everything. Mm -hmm. Kill the people. Kill the cattle. It's all for me to... That's it. It's a simple directive, really. Kill everything. Right. Well, I've done what the Lord said to do. And so Samuel famously says, what is the bleeding of the sheep in my ears? And what is the lowing of the oxen that I hear? You were supposed to kill the cattle, Saul. Why am I hearing this animal noise? You obviously did not do what the Lord told you to do. And you're standing here with all that cattle behind you, an egg egg over there, telling me that you did. What is going on here? Yeah. It's a hard attitude. It's a, it's a bad heart. It's he, wanting to do it my way. And he blames it on the people. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, they, they wanted to keep some of the best. And so we, we, we took the best, Lord, and we got rid of the rest. I hadn't commanded that. I commanded you to get rid of all of it. You didn't do that. So, as, uh, as Samuel pointed out, when he rebuked uh, uh, Saul for this, he said, 
rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. You've rebelled against the Lord because you haven't kept his command. He told you what to do and you did something different. That's rebellion. And he said to obey is better than sacrifice. Because if it's a sacrifice without obedience, it's an irrelevant sacrifice. It doesn't matter. You've just nullified any effectiveness for that sacrifice. So. And, and, Sa- and Samuel didn't, he's consistent in what he says to Saul because he didn't say to him, this is a good teachable moment for you. Let's, you know, let's, let's get the boat turned around and do what's right. He took a sword in his hand and he goes to Agag and hacks him to death. Yeah. Because God, you know, the commandment still stands. Saul's there arguing about what he did or didn't do. It's the people's fault. Well, you know, we, yeah, we did that. We killed everybody. But these were for the Lord. We kept those because we thought the Lord would want that. And then the people thought it would be a good idea. And you can just imagine Samuel as an old man looking at Saul and saying, just stop talking. Yeah. I've yeah. already told you, you've yeah. offended the Lord. And like I said, it wasn't just, you know, I'm old and wise. And so it's a good teachable moment for you because you're a young king. He goes directly over to Agag and, and puts him in the ground because... God had commanded it. So he honors what God told him to do. And he shows it by example. And I think that's important as well. So we have Samuel calling him Lord and then honoring him as Lord. We have Saul, which you already made the excellent point that we tend to do it as well in our own lives. But Saul somewhere in there says to himself, this will be better. The Lord's really going to appreciate this because I've thought about it. And some of this oxen and sheep are just gorgeous. I mean, who would deny that? Maybe they are. Maybe they aren't. I don't know. It's not the point. The point yeah. is you were given a direct order. And, you know, we talk about the Lord's army, soldiers of Christ arise. That we, when you're in an army and you're in ranks, you have a commanding officer and you do what he wants you to do. And I think that, you know, the ultimate authority comes from and trickles down from the king. The one who is mm-hmm. in power over that nation, who's been either been chosen or has been brought in as a, as a monarch. He is in charge, she is in charge, and what they say goes. And so to disobey that is punishable by death because you you can't think for yourself. You're under the reign of a king. And so, you know, again, in the spiritual realm, for our spiritual good, God says, here's what is most pleasing to me. And we take it and we go, hmm. I like about 90% of that. I, I like it. I like, yeah. like where you're going, Lord. Let me add this, or let me take let me take some of this out. There's a little too much of this, that, you know, for me and my to make my menu just right. And it shows immediately that he's not your lord. Right, you've changed it. You're still lord. Yep, you're doing it your way. And you know, someone might argue, well, all, those are all Old Testament examples. Well, yeah, they are. And Paul says they were written for our learning yeah, in First right. Corinthians uh, ten, I believe it is. That we might have hope. <laughs> yeah, we might have hope. They, they are examples for us. God is hoping that we get a lesson out of that. Yeah. But Jesus sees that this is an ongoing problem because mm-hmm. in the New Testament era, He asked this question: Why do you call me Lord, and don't do what I say? It it implies that there were even people then uh, following Him around, saying, "Oh, wow, He's the Lord." But then, not not really following him, mm-hmm. and he's he's calling them on it. And I think a lot of times, what happens today, especially as we look at the innumerable religions around us and all the confusion that's uh, fostered by that, is we'll say, well, yes, back then they were under the law; they had to, you know, cross the T's and dot the I's, but. Today, we're under grace. I have to ask, what, what is meant by that? Yeah. Are you saying that God once wanted obedience, but now he doesn't? Because we're under grace? Grace means we can kind of do whatever we want as long as we pay some lip service to God? Mm-hmm. Or maybe we're actually very sincere. We love Jesus, we say. He is my Lord but we're doing things that he has not commanded. And like grace covers that. I I can't see how because obedience is endorsed in the New Testament too. Uh, If you love me, John said, you'll keep my commandments. Those those are his record of what Jesus told him. So there you go. There's the Lordship. Yeah. 
If you're keeping my commandments and doing it because you love me, that's showing I'm your Lord. Yep. And that's what he wants. That's right. But it's, it's you know, people run with that. Oh, we're under grace. And then when you emphasize obedience, well, that's legalism. Okay, what's, what is your definition of legalism? It is, it's a label that's put on that to just kind of rebuke it and get away, you know, that's, that's invalid. That's legalism. We're not legalist anymore. So I'm not even going to address the issue. Just take it away so we can do it our way. So if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Is legalism, is that, what, is that what's being said? It's what it sounds like. The problem and, with the person who's arguing that too, like, like with you, they say, well, the, you know, now you've gone too far. You're forcing all this obedient stuff, and that's legalism. The problem is Jesus warned us of that, that very uh, attitude of heart as saying that he doesn't really mind uh, over in this area. Mm-hmm. Uh, he didn't say we couldn't. Those, those kind of things. Yeah. He absolutely makes that crystal clear in Matthew 15. He says to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, he says, God commanded, saying, honor your father and your mother. And he who curses his father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me, it's a gift to God. Then he need not honor his father and mother. Thus you've made the commandment of God of no effect by your traditions. So he's, he's pointing out this thing that they would say, if you've already declared it for the Lord, then you're free from helping your mother and your father. It was a loophole, it was a way around doing what God commanded you to do. Yep. yep. So then he says in verse 7, because he's pointing it out, hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they do worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Yep. They took something out of the law and they said here's a way we can keep from honoring our father and mother who have really been driving us crazy as it is i already gave this to the lord therefore i can't help you and jesus says you're a hypocrite and you're a liar because you're pretending to honor god with that which you have and you're drawing near with your lips oh no it's for the lord but your heart you've refused to honor your father and mother so your heart is not tied to what god commanded you to do and, and, and the consistency of that throughout all of Scripture is so painfully obvious that you know what the challenge is for us. If, if we lecture people about these things, about how important obedience is, walking in the light as he is in the light, that it begins to be said that we just don't believe in grace or we don't mm-hmm. trust in God's grace. And that can't be further from the truth. Yeah. Grace is all over the New Testament pages and Paul says it over and over again in the book of Romans that by the grace given to me, and he says, now you, by the grace given to you, what? What should you do by the grace given to you? Does he say disobey? (laughs) No. (laughs) He says to those who have the gift of ministry, minister. To those who have the gift of giving, give with cheerfulness. Mm -hmm. Just give it all that you have because that's your gift by the grace of God. And then we're told in Titus that the grace of God has appeared to all men, teaching us that we should and the rest of that passage is, you know, denying ungodliness, living faithfully and obediently to the Lord. That's what grace does. So it's not fair for someone to say that, well, you don't trust in grace. Yes, I do. And obedience is part yeah. of that. That's, that's uh, basically throwing up a straw man argument. It, it really is. It's, it's not even relevant to the issue. It's, it's dodging the point. And like you said, what is what is great in in order for me to understand grace that means i have to conclude that i can disobey and there are people who believe that they we talk about jesus being our lord and savior mm-hmm. there is a doctrine out there that draws a, a distinction between the two uh, and when you talk about obedience they'll accuse you well that's lordship salvation oh wow well I, I guess it is. <laughs> you know, so be it. I'm not sure what that exactly means. Um, the Bible sure doesn't talk about it. It just always describes him as Lord and Savior, not Lord or Savior. That's right. If he's going to be your Savior, then he has to be your Lord. And if he's your Lord, he'll be your Savior. You can't make the distinction. To me, it's just a variation of, well, that's legalistic. That's lordship salvation. Well, yeah, Jesus said, 
I, can, I can't call him Lord and then not do what he said. He condemned that. And what that comes down to is, is that has an effect on our everyday life. Uh, for example, the Hebrew writer says, don't forsake the assembly as the habit of some is. Well, I have to conclude that that means I can't forsake the assembly. When the saints assemble, I need to be there. Oh, but that's legalistic. Yeah, you're, you're being pretty hard you on You really? Us, I have to be there every week? There's the heart condition. Mm -hmm. Do I have to be there every week? Yeah. Well, yeah, but that's not the point. Do you want to be there every week? If I want to serve the Lord and do as he's commanded by encouraging my brethren, being with them, letting myself be encouraged by them, which I am every week. It's a tonic to be here and see everybody again, uh, to hear the singing of the congregation, to, to receive all of those blessings, to hear good teaching, to look into God's word, to be praying. You know, what the things that God wants to do, if I love him and want to keep his commandments, why would I not want to avail myself of that? Right. So when someone says, well, do I have to be there every week? Well, from that point of view, no, you don't have to. And it really doesn't matter because you don't want to. That's the issue. Ouch. And is that legalistic? Is that lordship salvation? If we're going to call him Lord, then we need to do what he says and assemble with the saints. When he says, let no profane speech come out of your mouth. Let your speech be seasoned with salt that it may give grace to those who hear it. If I decide I better do that, is that being legalistic? Maybe I, you know, I can use some soft curse words, you know, maybe, Maybe not harsh ones, but... And you'll decide which ones those yeah, are. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, set, I'll set the level on that. What's a harsh curse word and what's not harsh curse word? Hmm. I guess I have to turn to society for that. Let, let me so, say that yeah. there's typically, when, when this, these things come up and you know men are discussing, should we do this, can we do this, does the Bible allow us as a church, just for example, mm -hmm. the wise men in the room will always say something along the lines of, um, if we set this marker here, who's going who's gonna to guard this this? Mm, this yeah, marker, yeah. right? If we move it and we don't have permission from God, who's gonna who's gonna mark? Who's gonna stand here and guard it so we don't go further? And I love that question because, first of all, it implies that we're leaving what the Lord's given us to do. Yep. And secondly, when society changes or the whims of our children changes, then the guy who used to be tough on point A, point B, and point C isn't even alive anymore. Then we can. It's not. It's not a marker anymore. So it has to go back to what the Lord has given, and only that, because men fail. Man, mm -hmm. we know enough about this awful world by now to yeah. know that men cannot do it with the best of intentions, with the you know the highest hopes. None of that is relevant. God's word is eternal. It's for everyone who ever steps onto this earth and can hear his word, and it's for our salvation. So the, the Lord and Savior thing, as you said, always tied together. Uh, in the second Peter alone, it said, Four times, uh, he says, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, three times. And then he talks about the apostles of our Lord and Savior. And that's the fourth. So they are inseparable, as you pointed out. And one of the challenges, I think, is that we love Savior because that means salvation. It mm -hmm. means not having to pay for my own wretched sin, which I'm aware of and don't want to have to pay for. I love him as Savior. I love what that means. But Lord is really yeah. intrusive. It's kind of getting into my personal yeah, life. That's right. You're stepping on some toes now. So what happens is we say, well, I want fire insurance. I don't want to go to hell. He's my Savior, and I thank God for that. But he says, if I am not your Lord, as you pointed out, then I am not your Savior. Mm -hmm. You can't take part of me that you like. You take all of me. And by the way, it is not a pain. It's not a drudgery. It's not some awful curse. It is doing it the Lord's way and then growing in that understanding of, oh man, this is really good. Yeah. What he's I can doing see in my life. He wants this. Yes. Now. He kept yeah. me out of that serious yep. mess because I, he told me I couldn't be involved in that or I couldn't go watch that or I couldn't say these words. 
And he saves us every day from the trouble and the situation we would have been in if we let ourselves uh, set the moorings and decide, you know, what's right and what's wrong. And so if we just trust him and let him be Lord, and also being in love with the fact that he's Savior, then he's leading us by the hand through this life, and we are better off for it. Yeah, if we died to sin to be raised with Christ, like Paul describes in Romans 4, then we have given up our life. It's not my life anymore. I don't get to do what I want. That's right. And that's okay. Because <laughs> getting to do what I want leads to some real bad stuff, both in this life and eternally. Because I'm not always going to make the right decision on my own. The more and more as I'm getting older now and I look around at what is happening to society, it just drives the point home to me that as soon as we stop looking at the Lord, we completely lose sight of where to go. It doesn't take long either, does we, it? We descend into complete lunacy because we're not letting the Lord direct our steps. We tell ourselves, hey, I can direct my own steps. I, I got this. I'm, I'm, you know, I've learned a lot. I'm, I'm down with it. <laughs> Whatever, all of the little inane excuses and justifications, we throw at ourselves to talk ourselves into this and make ourselves feel better. If, if the second we turn away from the Lord and take that first step in our own direction, we are in darkness. And when you're in darkness, you cannot see where you're going. That's right. And you are going to smash yourself into a wall. You're going to destroy yourself. Society is doing that right now because God is not God. We've gotten him out of the picture finally. We've, we've grown up. We're, we're enlightened. Free. We're free. Yeah. And look what we're doing with that. I know. We can't even tell what a man or a woman is anymore. And we'll fight about it. Yeah, we? and we'll fight. No, that's fighting words. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's insanity. It is. We have to let Jesus be our Lord. He's the one who shines the light for us. He tells us the way to walk. He tells us we need to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. And okay, that sounds good. I can give 90% of that. <laughs> no, you do that. If that's your thinking, I'm not your Lord. That's right. He says, be holy as I am holy. He wants us to walk in holiness so people can see Jesus in us and be attracted to him. But wow, Lord, that means I can't go do that? I only do that once a week. It's not a big deal. Well, then you don't want to be holy as he is holy because Jesus doesn't even do that once a week. I, I love what Peter says about Jesus. He said there is no guile in him, no deceit. He's, he's pure. There's only one other person in the Bible that's said of, which is interesting to me. It's when Philip brought Nathanael to Jesus and Jesus said, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. And he said, compliment. Lord, how do you know me? What's interesting is he said, This is an Israelite indeed. Here's a true Israelite. Why? There's no guile in him. It's amazing. And he became one of the apostles. Uh, to me, it's just a, a powerful story, but that's how the Lord wants us to be. That's why he needs to be our Lord, and we have to allow him to be our Lord, too. If we're going to claim him as Lord, we need to act like he is that's right. our Lord. Yeah, that's right. And we can only do that by doing what he says. Yeah. I, and I would, you know, with the instruction he's given, I, I would just leave us with this. First John 3, in verse 2 John says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. This is like in our eternal glory John's talking about. It's not been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Back, mm -hmm. back to what you were saying, Christ watching him, seeing him for all that he is and knowing how pure he is, no guile, no deceit that those who have the hope in Christ are purifying themselves. And we can't mm -hmm. do that apart from him who is pure. Right. And you can summarize that statement there in two words. Who, whoever has this hope purifies himself just as he is pure. 
Imitate Christ. Imitate Christ, yeah. Two words. Follow him as closely as you can. Yeah. And that's a that's a process. It takes time. There's some, yeah, there's some we, things. We grow into that. We're honoring. Mm-hmm. There's some things that I have trouble letting go of. And, and you know, we need to be honest about that as well. Yeah. But anytime I say, no, Lord, I'll take it, take care of it this time, I'm saying less of you. You're Lord, but less of you and more of me. Yeah. And, and a servant never Who, has Who's really right. in charge in this situation? Yeah, we have no right to do we that. Need to, we need to face that honestly. As as God warned Cable, sin is lying at the door. You mean Cain? Or Cain. Who did I say? Abel? Cable. Cable? <laughs> wow. He's the third brother. That's not yeah, me. he's the third one. <laughs> No, but but he told him sin's lying at the door and you need to rule over it. Yeah, that's right. So That's always the case. Let's not open that door of opportunity to sin. Recognize Jesus as Lord and then live it that way. Amen. We have trivia questions? We do. All right. Um, I'll just let you do whatever you want to do. You want me to go first? Oh, well, go? I'm going to go home then. Oh, see you later. <laughs> uh, no, I'll, I'll do mine first. I think uh, you you uh, had the first question last week. Trivia. Sweet trivia. Just right off the bat, what did manna taste like? Man. The food that God gave to the people daily out in the wilderness. Manna in the morning, manna in the evening, manna at supper time. Yeah. Manna is that good. Oh, <laughs> oh manna. It's getting worse. They made a lot from it. They, I think they formed, they learned how to make manna cotty. <laughs> Someone opened the door and now the, horse, Someone. the horses are running out. You opened the door. <laughs> I had more mana jokes. I can't remember what they are. <laughs> That's good. You're welcome. <laughs> because answer the question. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so it, so it's and I'm trying to remember because I I know the the Israelites say we're tired of this loathsome bread. That's not what I you're know. looking for. No. What what did it? It taste like? was um um I, I don't know why I want to say flaky, but it, but it was it was a uh, a breaded substance. It, it had a flavor of honey to it, a light flavor of honey, and it, and beyond that, I can't remember. That's that's the answer. Exodus 16.31, it tasted like wafers, wafers made with honey. Yes, that's a much better word yeah. than flaky, whatever I said. Half but yeah, they could make it into a bread, apparently. Um, but it tasted good. I mean, honey's good stuff. Oh, man. It's the sweetest thing they knew of. Yeah, and full of energy. That's right. But uh, to, to think, here is food that God is giving you every day. And then enough to get through the Sabbath. And you're saying our soul loathes this bread. We detest this loathsome bread. From heaven. That's how you're viewing God's gift and his provision? Wow. You know what? That bread came with requirements. They had to obey. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that was part of the loathsome part. You had to go out and get only enough for that day. Unless You kept any more, it would spoil. Mm -hmm. But for the Sabbath... He provided enough for two. That's right. So, yeah. even with all that grace, there was a requirement right. to and follow. And he was trying to teach them, you need to depend on me every day. That's right. All right, question number one. Actually, you, you said Exodus? Exodus 16.31. Okay. Was the taste like honey. Question two for everyone out there. Enoch is the seventh from Adam, and he's one of the only two people who did not see death. Which New Testament epistle tells us that Enoch prophesied uh jude that is correct jude verses 14 and 15 prophesied of those who would speak evil against the lord and be disobedient yeah. wow. very good must have been the only occasion of that enoch was P- too people early. being being disobedient that's right when the world began oh so uh, yeah he yeah. didn't really know what he's talking about yep <laughs> okay i'm going to take us back to the episode with uh naaman the leper Okay. For our second question from me, uh, three of the characters in this were uh, Naaman, of course, who came to Elijah, and Elijah's servant, Gehazi. Mm-hmm. Uh, Naaman was cleansed of his leprosy, but why was Gehazi made a leper? Because the Syrian 
captain of the army. Yeah, Naaman. Yeah, Naaman. That's the better way to say it. Naaman <laughs> said to Elijah, I want to give gifts. Yeah. Let me, and, and Elijah said, we want no part of that. Gehazi, Gehazi, after Naaman leaves, he follows him. And he catches up with him. And he says, you know what? We got new prophets that just showed up. We need clothing. So he requests a gift. And then he, when he comes back, Elijah said, well, where have you been? And he says, oh, nowhere. Yeah, I wasn't up to nothing. Can you imagine <laughs> lying to a prophet? <laughs> yeah. So he says, I, I wasn't, I don't know what you're talking about. And he says, okay, then the, the leprosy of Naaman yeah. shall be on you. And there again, how easy we deceive ourselves. Uh-oh, he's on to me, but I can pull the wool over this prophet's eyes. Which you're saying that I can pull the wool over God's eyes. That's right. God didn't see this. No, boy. And he wound up being the leper in the story. Very good. So what's the verse for that? Where That, is, uh, that whole wonderful account is in Second Kings chapter 5. Yeah, that's a verses twenty through twenty seven shows us what the the in incident there involving the gift. Okay. And Naaman, of course, was happy to give it. He felt grateful that's right. for the gift he had received. Mm -hmm. He didn't he didn't know he was being deceived by Gehazi, so he said, Take this, go take it back to your master. I'm happy to give this. Um, but it was deceit and greed is the whole the whole operative there. It's, Took the gift to his own demise. Yep. Um, Number okay. two for me. Yeah, so we're, we're at 100%. This is the last one. So there's uh, a lot of pressure. Oh, I'm feeling it. On you. Yeah. Because most people will get this right. Where's that towel, man? I'm sweating it. This Here is we... what we call a pregnant pause. Hmm. It's, it's called dead air, too. <laughs> That's right. It's not a good thing. All right. What was the first city to have a victory over Israel after they entered into the land of Canaan? AI. AI, Joshua 7, verses 2 through 5, because someone took of the accursed things yep. that God said they could not. So Joshua 7, 2 through 5, the city of AI had victory over the great nation of Israel. Very good. Um, so we had looked at the question, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? He is Lord and Savior of all, whosoever will may come. Mm -hmm. Uh, put him on, be obedient to him, be, be baptized, obviously, confessing his name, turning away from and repenting of our sins, and living a life of faith dedicated to him that we know, we understand, and we love the fact that he is Lord. What a blessed privilege to call him Lord, and that he takes ownership of us, mm -hmm. and that he is our Savior, and that he longs to see us to be saved, yep. that we're lockstep with every desire coming directly from the heart of God. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, we don't want to talk about lordship salvation in some kind of derogatory way, but to know that he is Lord and that requires some things of me. We hope and pray this has been a helpful study for you, uh, as, you as you've gone through this with us. Uh, be brave, be courageous in your daily life. Stand up for the truth. Do what is right. Be a blessing to those around you. Until next time.